improving access to geoanalytical research data and get to know where it's from. How do we do that? Please ask some questions through the question and answer box or in the chat, and uh, we'll try to address them during the discussion. Now, we'll follow the general introduction of the debate, uh, introduction of the panelists, moderator, and then we'll start off with the first part of the debate in which the panelists give a little statement. And um, then we go to the discussion with the closure summary. Together with um, Marta Klocking, Gertje Termaat, and Lucia Profeta, uh, we organized this, this great debate because we thought it's um, quite important to have a discussion about improving access to geo geoanalytical data, its heritage, its provenance, as the data is the backbone of our research and we use it every day to solve questions we may have. It's important to be able to discover it, but it's also important to be able to evaluate the value of the data once you've found it and to, um, uh, yeah, be able to assess the quality. So some information should be available on how the data was collected, modified, and then um, publicized. So from the um, take one at the EGU, there's a couple of insights where uh, we've got a very diverse community with different methods, different samples, different applications, and that the barriers for adoption of more standardization in the um, uh, geoanalytical data is, is mostly cultural. So we're, we're, we can be scared of being scooped or the data being scooped before we get to publish it. And maybe there is a lack of credit for um, when you publish data. So you don't get always reference to a data publication. And um, um, data management at the finish line. Um, yeah, this point there, um, it's, it's difficult to, um, when is data set finished, right? Do you need to publicize it when it comes from the machine or do you need to um, publicize it when you're publishing your paper? And then the last point is um, that the sticks we have, data policies in labs or in, in institutes, they're not so strongly enforced. Now today we've got four speakers invited to shed their light on the topic. And the first speaker is Katie Chamberlain from the Teesside University in the UK. And Katie is an igneous petrologist and field volcanologist specializing in the in situ microanalytical techniques. And she's also passionate about changing the data culture in geochemistry and making geochemical data fair. Then the second sp uh, speaker is Steve Goldstein. He's Higgins Professor of uh, Earth and Environmental Sciences at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of the Columbia University. And Steve is a geochemist. He uses natural radioactive decay in geochronology uh, geochronometry and process tracing. He's promoted best practices since a while in uh, geochemical data and publicizing, publishing it in, for example, things such as the editor's round table that he helped to establish. Then Leslie Wyborn, she um, was invited very last minute and she is honorary professor at the Australian National University in Canberra and she's a long-term geochemist and she's involved in many data science projects uh, concerning geoscientific data within Australia and around the globe. Then last up is Olivier Pouret. He's associate professor at the Uni La Salle in France and he's a hydrogeochemist with particular interest in trace metal fractionation low temperature aqueous systems. He's also a strong advocate for open and inclusive science. So be really interesting to hear his point of the, on the matter. Now, um, each of the speakers will introduce themselves, give a short view on the topic. And then Kirsten Leonard, who is senior research scientist at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, also Columbia University. She'll be leading the discussion. And she's also in her 
usual job leading the EarthCam data facility, the Astromat Materials Data System and System for Earth Sample Registration or CESAR. Then some brief announcements. Yeah, as I said, please use the Zoom question and answer feature to ask your questions. And you can also ask questions in the chat. And then there is participants who are joining via the live stream on the EGU website. And they won't be able to ask questions directly, but we'll monitor the chat there and we'll try and transfer those questions to Zoom. Um, yeah, let's, that's it. That's all. Let's get to the core of the debate. And uh, I'll hand over to Kirsten who might have a few words to say as well. Yeah, welcome everybody. And I've already been actively chatting here with uh, <laughs> with people in the audience. It's uh, it's always sad that, you know, there is just a screen uh, in front of me. It was fantastic at the EGU meeting in Vienna to see at least part of the audience in person. But so uh, that's why I'm trying to establish a little bit of a dialogue here in the chat. Uh, so please, continue to um, introduce yourself and uh, also to really participate in, in this debate. So we're gonna start off with the um, uh, comments of the panelists who have put together a few slides to uh, provide you with a first view of, of their um, involvement and their opinion. Um, about geochemical data standards and geochemical data sharing. Um, let me just add, uh, you know, thanks Alex for introducing me. That was, was really nice. So I'm actually running a data facility, um, EarthChem as a place where geochemical data are shared. And my interest has for many years been um, to get the community um, engaged in defining what is needed to make data reusable. And, you know, we, um, we're we making progress, but not enough. And this is uh, a great opportunity for us to, to take another large leap forward. Um, and we're gonna hear a little bit later about efforts, I think, uh, such as One Geochemistry, a new initiative to, uh, to facilitate a global uh, collaboration on geochemical data standards. Um, I just wanted to say at this point already that for those of you who may be in Hawaii um, uh, 10 days from now for the Goldschmidt conference that uh, we're gonna have a, a booth in the exhibit hall for the One Geochemistry Initiative. And it's a great place to stop by and talk a little more on standards and um, data sharing in geochemistry. And I think uh, with that, I will leave it uh, for now and get started with our presentations. And it is a great pleasure to start off with Katie. Um, who has been um, already a very vocal and enthusiastic supporter of a culture change in geochemistry. So Katie, please take it away. Thanks, Kirstine, and hopefully I can move the slides. Thanks, Alexander. Wonderful. Um, yeah, so I, I've, I've been given a very kind introduction. Um, I am a petrologist. I specialize in um, collecting textural um, and in situ data. And so for the volcanic rocks that I work on, it's about combining kind of the field locations with um, textural observations, perhaps qualitative rather than quantitative, and then quantitative in situ compositional data and kind of connecting it all the way through. So, um, you know, I collect a range of different geochemical data and I, you know, I really, I think this debate is an excellent opportunity for us to talk about how we can do better as a community and why we should be making geoanalytical data fair and accessible, given the amount of money that we are that we receive, you know, that if we think about the, the cost per analysis that we have, the more that we can make this data reusable, the better value for money we're going to get. Um, and the more we can seek to answer kind of these larger questions within geosciences. Um, so I think my kind of introduction oops, um, to um, 
to kind of the, the challenges of, of sharing ge geoanalytical data and how we kind of how we archive it and make it available came when you know fairly later on in my career and and for that i'm i'm quite sad that i wasn't introduced to it during my phd um, and at kind of the earliest stages when i was collecting geoanalytical data but working with geophysicists working across disciplines between labs trying to communicate the the different uncertainties that we have with geoanalytical data the different methods that we have and, and the different things that we can resolve um, was really challenging and trying to have kind of a uniform approach to how we report our geoanalytical data and the associated metadata will allow us to be more interdisciplinary it will allow us to uh, be more effective in communicating the limitations but also the applications of our geoanalytical data and i think that's what i was kind of trying to represent with this uh, cartoon um here is how we can be more interdisciplinary how we can use geoanalytical data across across different disciplines to couple um with with other areas of geoscience and i think another reason why we should be making our data fair is to have a more inclusive scientific community. And I really like this, um, this uh, diagram here where we're looking at, you know, there was this really interesting paper looking at how to make uh, an integrated coordinated open network science in volcanology, geochemistry and petrology. And a key part of this is having fair data and fair tools and thinking about how our data are findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And I think that's, part of our responsibility is, is to make geon, geochemistry kind of more inclusive by sharing our data in, um, in a fair way. And, and finally, my kind of last point is, you know, uh, often we might think about, you know, the, the different repositories and the different tools that are available. And obviously those are the building blocks that we need to be able to share our geoanalytical data in a fair way, but actually, the more people that I talk to, you know, uh, the more I talk to students, I'm like, have you thought about how you're going to, you know, share your data? What metadata do you need to, to have to, so that people can use your data moving forwards? Um, I think there's, there's more discussion that can be had about how we have this data culture change. You know, this, for me, I, I'm, I think that this should be included within all graduate programs where we're collecting geoanalytical data. And I think at the moment, it's, it's very variable depending on the experience you have and I think what we what would be great is if we can um, have this kind of change where it's not oh I have to do this because uh, a, um, a journal or a funding body says we have to archive our data but thinking about how we're going to store and share our data as we're collecting it is is incredibly important and I recognize I'm probably speaking to the converted here um, in, as part of this debate but I think it's something that um, I personally want to work on is having that discussion with everyone that I work with whenever we're collecting data as we are collecting it is how are we going to store this how are we going to make it reusable and accessible for other people moving forward so um i think very much this bottom-up approach as well as the top down um with the you know enforcing the requirements from funding agencies and journals to make sure our data is um uh findable and accessible uh interoperable and reusable is is really important but that's um probably all from me Okay, so um, yeah, th thanks very much for that real that kind introduction, Alex. Um, I'm Steve Goldstein, and um, as Alex said, I'm a ge I'm a, um, I'm, a, I'm a geologist actually at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory who practices geochemistry, and I use and I use isotopes to um, basically try to figure out how old things are and to trace geological processes. Um, along with um, major and trace elements. And I've also spent a lot of years as an editor. And as you can see from my old face, um, I've been doing it for a while. And I, I just want to give a perspective that we're having done it for a while that I've really seen a lot of changes over time about how to deal with data. And I just want to kind of um, tell you what it was like when I was in graduate school. And, um, you know, at that time, data was published only in data tables and journal papers. And if you wanted to get that data, you had to go to the library, you had to go to the journal, you had to get a copy of the paper, 
copy of the of the paper somehow. And um, there might be a data table. If there was too much data, there wouldn't even be a data table, right? You might have to just try to read it off of the um, off of the off of the figures. And so we've come a long way, okay. Um, and you you would have had to do it because of pay. You know, there's there's a limit to how how much, you know, how how long a paper, a uh, published paper could be at the time, still is right. Um, but we're you know we're in a digital world now, and 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 that was the first fundamental change. Um, one of the questions that you know we were asked to consider here is why should analytical data be made public and why not and um frankly i really think that um, i should be surprised that we are ha still having this debate in 2022 and um this is an example of my first slide no go to go to my go back please Right. They, this is 19 years ago in 2003. Um, the editors of the Chemical Geology published a guide to publishing data in that journal, where we said, if you want to publish data in chemical geology, this is the analytical information, i.e., the metadata that you need to include. And um, even at that time, we were really surprised that we would that we had to do that because geochemistry, since at least the 1960s, um, has been the major driver in improving analytical chemistry and in improving the quality of analytical data. It hasn't been chemistry; it is geochemistry. And in 2003, this had been going on already for 40 years, and yet. The quality of the analytical sections of manuscripts submitted to chemical geology by geochemists was very spotty. And this editorial was one of the first attempts to impose standards on the publication of geochemical data. And in fact, I think it is the first time a, ge a journal published a set of standards for reporting geochemical data. Um, just want to say it. Just I'll read the abstract because it's so short, but this is what it's all about. In an international journal such as Chemical Geology, it is vitally important to include a reasonable assessment of precision and accuracy and appropriate information regarding the analytical methodology so that the data can be compared between different laboratories. And the policy of the journal is to ensure adequate document documentation is at the policy of this journal to ensure adequate documentation is outlined below. It's been 20 years, almost 19 years since we published this, and we're still discussing this. So thanks, Alex. Can you go to the next slide? Okay, so, but the answer to the question, should analytic, should scientific data be public and fair? Well, the answer is yes, it should be. What are the uh, what are the arguments before? Firstly, science is driven by ideas and data are the foundation of the ideas. Second, in order to be able to evaluate the ideas, we need to have access to the data. And I have to say that there is a recent paper that was published that I was not able to get the data that was used to um, published in 2022, that I have not been able to get the data that was used to make the arguments in that paper. So this is still a problem, okay? Moreover, ideas are often ephemeral. Good data is long lasting, okay? We publish papers for the ideas, that's the science, but we change our ideas we can still, even when we change the, our ideas, we can, still, um, we can still use the data. Another, I think, very important aspect to consider is that we use main, mainly public funds to pay for science. And therefore, we have an obligation to the public to make that data public. Um, 
So the question is not whether scientific data should be public and accessible, but rather how to make it so. And so I would say that there are no arguments against making data accessible, but there are a lot of challenges. So Alex, if you can go to the next slide. Okay, so what are some of the challenges? Here's a list of some of the challenges that we might wanna talk about. Okay, where should data be stored? And I wanna say that it should not be by journals or publishers because um, we need a reliable long-term term source of data. And I wanna give an example. I was looking for data on isotopes in manganese crust that were published in the 1990s. I went to the journal, I went to the, I went to the, um, I clicked on the link and the link didn't work anymore for several papers. Luckily, these, uh, the authors are still active, even though it was the 1990s. I went to them, I was able to get the data. They were shocked that the data, their data was no longer accessible. And one of them actually couldn't find it and went to an old floppy disk and ended up getting the data off of a old floppy disk somehow. I don't know how they did it, but, but they did. So not by journals or publishers. How are we gonna pay for long-term data and storage and who should pay? And one of the ways that, one of the business models, a, ma a major business model is to try to make authors pay for it. You know, I think that that's a problem in places like the United States where grants do not pay, even pay for the science that we're trying to do. Okay, another important question is, when should the data be made public? That is, should it be made public on, on publication? Or otherwise, what's a reasonable uh, moratorium time frame to have uh, researchers keep their data withheld? That's an important question. Next, next, next um, bullet point: How do we enforce data sharing? I think funding aid people will do whatever funding agencies tell them to do, and they'll do whatever journals will <laughs> tell them they need to do in order to get their papers published. Those are possibilities. This is the question is an important question. And I just wanted to note about note that peer review does not seem to be a um, good way to enforce data sharing. My experience is that um, peer review is really hit or miss. And um, one way that we, one thing we don't want to do is to have a sentence that says, well, if you want the data, contact the author. That never works. Okay, how do, next bullet, how do we determine appropriate data and metadata standards and how do we enforce them? That's a, that's a problem. How do we, the next one is a really important one for the data producer. How do we ensure allocation of credit for data? For example, when we do data syntheses, often the people who generated the individual data in that synthesis do not get cited. And the last point is very important for data pr producers. How do we ensure recognition of the importance of their contributions by promotion and evaluation committees? So, that's a list of some of the challenges. So thanks very much. Um, that's, that's what I have to say for now. There is Leslie. Hi. Um, I apologize for the fact that Simon and Sean, I had to pull out at the last minute and I'm the last minute replacement or should I say last second. So I'm just going to, um, give you my experience with geochemistry and probably go back a bit further in history than Steve did. Um, I did my PhD in, in geochemistry with Professor Bruce Chappell. He was a brilliant geochemist and he invented the XRF. 
his favorite saying was quantify your data and no one would argue with you. So he was my introduction to databases. But the important thing was that I was at that edge when XRF came in. The number of analyses you could do in three years in a PhD went from 15 in weight chemistry to 300. And my career started out with a problem. Because in the 1970s, the number of analyses you could publish in a typeset table per publication was 15 and stayed at 15 for the next 20 years. And so data supplements became the norm. The dark ages of geochemical data began. It went from sharing our data, which is all we could do over three years of 14 wet chemical analyses and publishing them to, like me getting my first paper rejected because I put it in 20 analyses and no PhD student could possibly do that many. My analyses must be garbage. And so we went into the dark ages where what we say, data mining took over, you know, it's mine, it's mine, you can't have it only through a data supplement. And then the questions emerged, where is my data? Where did it come from? How was it obtained? And so really we've been trying to improve access to geoanalytical research data since those dark ages of the 1980s began when the dreaded data supplements came in. I joined the government agency in 1977 and was a proto granite specialist. Must have collected over a thousand proto granite samples and you wonder why my knees are shot because Bruce always encouraged students to have representative samples, which for course granites was 30 kilos. In the late 1990s, I was funded by 20 minerals exploration companies to do a compilation and metallogenic evaluation of 10,000 proterozoic granite analyses, mainly by trying to munge together these data sets from eight geological survey databases. And I don't think the word standard had been invented. But remarkably, spend getting this data set together in a few weeks a pattern dropped out where we could see nine major granite types depending on depth and pressure of their source regions 90 percent of them were formed in geothermal gradients of 30 degrees or higher and as you can see in this figure in the right this is modern day crustal heat flow in the proterozoic and it is exceptionally high and everybody ignores it because it doesn't fit the data so next slide please with the data this is the power of being able to put data in great data sets. So on the right, you have the Australian Proterozoic and here I'm plotting Thorium. And on the left, you have the modern arcs. And you can see straight away, if you look at Tuttle and Bowen, then you know these granites are formed at low pressure because they're all granites, they're high silica. Andesites are extremely rare in the Australian Proterozoic. So here was, I thought, a wonderful story. And I did as, Bruce taught me to, quantified my data, but nobody really believed it. But anyway, I'm just saying it was where I got hooked on multidisciplinary science and data. Next slide. And at the end of this project, I thought, hmm, this is what you could get out of Australia. What could happen if we had a global geochemistry database? Unfortunately for me, GA valued my data science skills more than my geochemistry skills and sentenced me to the next 15 years building data systems and interoperability experiments and all sorts of other things that most of you who are on this call know me for. But after I left GA in 2014, I met two fantastic groups. One was a group of enthusiastic geochemists who were in that first slide, who all shared this vision of one geochemistry as a global geochemical data network that facilitates, promotes discovery and access of geochemical data through coordination and collaboration amongst international geochemical data providers. I also at that time met up with a group of disgruntled AGU members who were just sick of data being hidden in supplements and the Making Data Fair project was born and that's a link to a paper in Nature on it and now databases have to, sorry, it has to be in databases linked to the papers. Fortunately, after an effort of nearly 40 years, we've killed off those horrid data supplements that led to so much data mining in those last 50 years. So now what we need to do is to agree how we can coordinate these databases 
through community agreed standards that enable interchange globally of data between multiple systems. This is one geochemistry. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie, and whispering. And we move to our last panelist, Olivier. Thank you, everybody. This was a great uh, range of input and opinions that we've heard. And um, there was already one question that is being discussed in the um, in the chat. Uh, <clears throat> but let me just um, kind of try to put out some of the, or summarize some of the, um, the concerns and um, uh, insights that have been brought up. I, again, you know, we, we already had on an earlier slide um, that Alex showed um, the summary of our, you know, ideas that came up in the debate at the meeting and, um, it becomes clear again that uh, I think the uh, the major challenges that we're fa yeah thank you the major challenges that we're facing are really in the culture and they um, they pertain a lot to this lack of credit and the implementation and I saw that Dominique. Uh, commented in the chat on the problem that you know giving credit doesn't help if that credit isn't recognized in the um, <laughs> at the universities at you know in the promotion procedures and so on and I think there is change and I would love to hear um, from the panelists but also from uh, the audience, please put in the chat or or let us know if you would like to speak. We can give you speaking um, uh, permission. Uh, what your experiences are? Is there a change in in any way inside? There has been. I mean, from my experience, this has been a topic discussed so much in workshops and conferences, at sessions, and so on. And people have come up with ideas and, and it seemed to me that there is a little bit of movement, uh, but A, do you see that? And B, what can we do to uh, go from this slow and, and limited um, progress to something that really makes a difference? So I please raise your hand if you want to comment. Uh, because otherwise I'm um, not not sure who's going to be talking. You have the raise hand, yes, yeah, Steve. Okay, I, I've been, the, this uh, this is a huge problem on many levels, and it's pr particularly as I said, where I see it a lot is in data syntheses, where data could be coming from a lot of different papers, and I, you know, I'm. I've been on many um, promotion and career committees and um, been involved in a lot of promotions. And um, I'm real, I'd really like, I'm really looking forward to hearing from the people who are participating um, about what they think can be done about this, this issue, because um, one of the things that you know we can't we can't do is we can't go into a promotion and say, well, this person's actually done a lot more than it appears they've done. It's just that they're not getting credit for what they've done. So we need to figure out different ways for people to get credit. Um, we hear a lot about people talk a lot about how things like citations are too. Um, there's too much um, focus that's put on citations and things like that, and that may be that and, and I'm not going to argue uh, that that's that's true, I think, but the problem here is partly that people are not getting cited for their their um, for their contributions, and so I think that at least one of the things that we can do is try to figure out a way to make sure that at least the people get cited for their data contributions. 
So I just want to put that in there that that's one of the things that we can do. It just has, you know, clearly a technical problem in having, you know, just thinking of Leslie's um, presentation about the tens of thousands of analyses uh, that just were Australia, if you have a global compilation of granites and you do data science on that, it, it is still a big hurdle to cite, you know, 2000 papers and give credit. But, you know, that's obviously, and I don't know, maybe I should let Leslie talk because she might be addressing this. <laughs> Not quite. I was just wanting to make the point with Steve. I agree with you. We've got to work out how to get that citation attached to the data almost at the analysis level. So it travels with the data. Um, there's another group that's working on being able to cite a bucket of 10,000 analyses so that each analysis can be recognized <coughs> and traced. It's called a reliquy. And there's a group working on that. So number one, we have to get that, so that promotion, they can actually state that. The second thing though, is in valuing people who do this work. Even if they can say, look, I did 10,000 analyses and go look at the GA repository. You can see how many rocks are from me. But do the people value that or do they only value the science? So that's where a real cultural change has to come in. And the second thing also, I think like, um, well, look at my career, which I think I gave a paper on geochemistry. A lot of people here didn't know that I was a serious geochemist, but I was the one who could do data, data science. Instead of valuing that, as a person who could do both, I was siphoned off to be doing all sorts of geophysics and paleontology and polycobbles and all sorts of things because that was what they valued and it cut me off from doing geochemistry. So I think we call these people the translators, the people, the fringe dwellers, the people who can work in both camps. They're the people we really need to find and value as well, apart from valuing researchers who look after their data. In my era, a true scientist was one whose data and um, conclusions could be independently validated. We now no longer value the scientist who comes along with evidence-based research. Let me just quickly comment on that in between. It's but from my perspective, been really interesting um, as a theme chair at the Goldschmidt conference um, with a new theme on, on big data and the, the explosion of abstracts that are now coming in doing data science, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning on geochemical data. So I kind of hope that that explosion, the interest in you know, creating new, um, new science through the use of large volumes of data will drive a bit more this uh, you know, question, how do we deal uh, with, with data access and how do we give credit for the data? Um, so please also you know, put your opinions into the chat. We really would like to hear from everybody in the audience. So Katie, please go ahead. Thanks, Christine. I think um, there's a lot we can learn. Uh, and, and I think assessment in terms of for tenure or from a promotion or for hiring is changing quite a lot in the last kind of five, 10 years with respect to kind of outside of pure publication. You know, we're now recognizing more EDI work that people are doing. And I think this is an opportunity for us to learn from, from those adaptations that are being made, that recognition that people are getting for not just the number of publications, but also kind of their work in the whole and how that what they're doing as part of the community. And I think hopefully, we can start to raise that as as a really important thing about you know we need to recognize that curating data and making sure it's uh, and collecting data is is valued just as much as as the publications but i saw um a comment about you know the challenges being really we need to have funding to be able to 
do this and often it's not a priority for universities or research institutes to have to kind of supply the funding to allow data to be made fair and to kind of spend time doing that and I think that's something also that really needs to um needs to improve and I, I don't know I don't think I have an answer for how how we go about doing that but I think you know we need to recognize that the generation of new science is not just the person writing the paper about it is how we collect it it's the, those analytical developments it's how we curate that data it's those database managers it's all of these things come working together to allow us to have these new insights to try and interpret our data rather than just the the final end product and i think that's where we can maybe do better thanks and i'm Kind of distracted by this discussion that's going on in the uh, in in the chat already about um, how we could potentially um, move forward in with with citations and you know what I just said in my last comment here is that I think the technology is probably there just including you know all the DOIs of original papers. Um, that have contributed data to a given data set, uh, including those in the metadata of the data set DOI will allow us to generate statistics also about how often data have been reused. It is, well, from my experience, the big challenge is the implementation. And we've seen that with you know, the recommendations from the editor's roundtable that Steve was, was part of where everybody agreed, yeah, that should happen. But the, the editors, the reviewers at the journals just didn't take the necessary steps and didn't feel that they had the power, but also uh, to, um, to enforce it and also didn't have the resources and the time to look at uh, you know everything pertaining to the data so there's there's a lot i think in the process and in the resources that are available um, to to make it happen yes olivier yeah it is an important issue to to get the data from the paper but uh, many authors said uh, data will be available upon request. So it is not acceptable anymore, I think. I, I, I did write that uh, 15 years ago in, my po in a postdoc paper. And I think it is one of the uh, wrong sentences I wrote in a, in a paper. I say that because uh, I, the data set was not mine. I work in a big project and the data set was available uh, on the website for the project. And this website was not available anymore and we do not have any more of the data set. So uh, it is not the, the only example of that. And I think a, a, few, a few weeks ago or, or last week, a paper from uh, in medicine uh, from Quash and people said, that uh, in their domains, about 90% of people who said that are available upon request do not answer to request. So uh, we, we need to work as a reviewer, as editors, to request authors to, to put their data on repository before being published, I think it should be more, uh, uh, mandatory in the future. Thanks, Olivier. And I see Steve has, and you know, there are, there's also communication going on in the questions and answers part, the, the Q and A with interesting questions. I will come back to that uh, question in a moment, but uh, Steve now. Yeah, actually I, I want to address um, the discussion in the chat about, um, the number of limit on, limits on the number of citations. Um, in the, I mean, I, I can I can see the I can see the value of limiting citations in the um, paper version of a um, of a paper. But um, we have, you know, there's no reason to limit the number of citations in a digital version. And in fact, 
Um, one of the things that I learned at a fair meeting that I went to a couple of years ago is that now nature, although it limits the number of citations that it publishes in the paper version of, of, of an article, um, the official version now is the is the web version of the article. And I just don't see any reason why there should be a limit to the num you know, that number of citations in the web version of an article. And if that actually becomes the standard of the um, official version of a paper, then actually all of the um, you know, indices are going to have are going to be able to take those citations. So you know, I think we have ways to help to make sure that cre credit is given where it's due, even now, in ways that we're not doing now. So you I want to advocate that that be the policy of all of all journals. Yeah, thanks, Kirsten. Yeah, I just want to add something to what you said, Steve, because I, I know that we have discussions about exactly this issue when I'm, I'm chief editor for a system science data and we have many data compilations and we have this request very often. And I know that even though it is only online, the typesetting has to be done. And I think at this point, there is a difference whether you have 50 pages of citations to be typeset and checked for all the links or whether you have just one page of, of references. I don't think that we have to drop it. So I think it is essential. And I always try to make sure that this is happening, that, that everything is cited. But I also can understand a, a publisher who says, we have to, to think about the limit of work. And if we, if we're really forced to to have everything cited, um, I guess this will be represented in a in an increase of APCs, for example. But what we can also do is, but this is what they don't know. What what we do at at GFC at GFC Data Services, um, I make sure that even for for compilations, I include all the all the references in the metadata. And this, I think the most, the highest number is 1,400 for a huge compilation on global heat flow. And at the moment, the credit for data citation is not fully acknowledged, but this could be an option to outsource the necessity to cite everything in the paper, but to make sure you have everything cited and in the, in the machine actionable metadata on the data publication side. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's it's an important point that you know the repositories can move forward and should and maybe you know make it make these um, citation statistics also available to the researchers in a very prominent way to kind of uh, demonstrate how cool it is to have a lot of data citations you know and and that might contribute to a culture change. Yes, Leslie. Um, I just put a link in the chat at RDA last week. There was a group that involved somebody from the German Clients Climate Centre, Deb Agrawal from Department of Environment and Shelley Stoll from AGU and, and the publishers are involved as well. And that group is trying to work out how you cite something when you've got, you know, 200, even a thousand within a reliquy or bucket. And it would be fantastic that, um, oh, sorry, um, I've just got to repeat my, th yeah, right, Alex has now put it to everyone. Sorry, I sent the wrong We're looking for people to um, work. And if this is so important for geochemistry, um, sign up. You can get all the links through that page I've just put in. Yeah, Alex reposted it, so yeah, great. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who are on the line, RDA is the Research Data Alliance. Just uh, it's an international organization that promotes and and um, promotes standards and developments uh, in the research data ecosystem. Very important for our. Um, I think I mean this. This is a really interesting discussion, and we really need to stay with that. And I 
also think that it is important um, to get more of the publishers into this discussion. Um, so we, we definitely need to um, reach out, I think, maybe, you know, Goldschmidt is an, <laughs> a good opportunity in, in 10 days to, if you stop by at any of the booths uh, that may be there, I'm not sure I'd, <laughs> how many of the publishers actually now participate in these exhibits. It's, it's good to bring the topic up um, as, as a concern of the community. I think that's, that's really important. I've seen Melanie have uh, posted a question here that I would like to um, bring up um, to the panelists and to the audience. Uh, and this is, you know, the um, an issue that I in with my Earthcam uh, library as a domain specific repository am struggling with or dealing with uh, clearly as well. So Melanie had posted this short story here that during a recent consultation on data publications, a PhD student uh, had wanted to publish his data on Zenodo. Um, he was at first easily convinced that it would be better to publish it in a domain repository, but then there was so much work involved in getting it into the right shape, adding all the metadata that were needed and so on, that due to the lack of time and publication and the pressure of the research paper needs to go out, we need a DOI uh, for that data set, it ended up in Zenodo. And you know, this is an experience at the EarthChem library that if we really try to get the highest quality of metadata, sometimes people say, okay, come on, I'm, I'm done with this. I'm gonna put it in Figshare and get my DOI anyway. So the question here is, is any kind of data publication better than none, when and where should we start to train researchers on good data documentation and importance of sharing data? And this clearly also pertains in how do we create the tools uh, that help us you know, make it easy to keep all the information on data quality with the data starting in the lab all the way down to publication. Yes, yeah, Steve. Okay, I, I have a very strong opinion about this. Okay. Um, and the answer is no, um, anything, um, anything is not better than none in this case. Okay, because if the data is doesn't have the appropriate metadata that people can use to evaluate its quality, then it's it not, might be the best data in the world, but we can't count on it. Okay, so my so in my view, um, we've we've been talking about credit and how we need to give people who generate the data credit for that data, and get you know even if it's being published in a synthesis of many other data papers. One of the ways that we can do it is to accredit um, um, specific data repositories or data sites such that if you want to, you know, you can't publish anything in any publication and get a citation that's recognized, right? There are the, the citation indices decide who they're going to recognize and who, who they don't recognize. We could do the same thing with data. And if we do that, okay, if you publish your data in, a, if, in an accredited repository, then you can get credit for that data. That would be a way to encourage people or incentivize people to actually do it right. So I'd like to suggest that that's a possible solution to this problem. The answer, and once again, the answer is no. Um, it's <laughs> not okay to public, just stick it anywhere. Does any, anyone else from the panelists want to respond to this? Yeah. 
Yeah, Katie. I guess really just to agree with with Steve, I think it's really important. And I think that's what's um, really useful about the domain repositories is that you have the requirement for metadata. And yes, it takes more time. And and I think that's part of why we need to change this. This, well, I mean, we're in such a competitivist culture that it's all about getting the publications and then moving on to this and then moving on to this. And there's always so many things to do that often, and you know, speaking personally, when I'm like, oh, I've got to try and arrange all these things and to make sure that it's storable in Earthchem, then, then it falls off the list. But we shouldn't be thinking that it's too much work to do it. It's actually a way to make our data reusable. It, if we, you know, yes, it's more work, but it means that our data is more valuable moving forward. And so I think that's where we need to start thinking about it. As soon as we collect the data, we need to be thinking, okay, you know, as you're collecting the data, download the templates that are available on Earthcam. Start, like, populate it from there. You know, there are stages that we can do to minimize this work rather than having all of your data ready, ready to submit the publication. And then you're like, oh, I need to deposit it in a repository. And so I think that's the, the real, that's where we can change the process. And that's what we can be kind of, or working on individually. Yeah, great. That really important. Yeah, Steve, then Olivier, and then Dominic. Yeah, I just want to say it's already so much work to get a project from beginning to publication. It's so much work to get to generate the data. It's just got to become part of the process. Right. I mean, the, the reason why people don't want to do that is because it's not part of the process. You can get your date. You know, the, the objective is to get your publication. And once your publication is accepted, the incentive is gone for a lot of people. So we have to basically make it part of the process of publication. That's it. Thanks, Olivier. Yeah, uh, with the, um, in France, we have a, a, a new law for open science. I guess it is uh, four years old, and it is now mandatory for PhD students to consider data sharing in their project. And they receive a, a kind of passport of open science, where part of the oh, passport cool. is on data sharing. I can share the the, the document and it it is very good but the main issue is that uh, uh, principal investigator do not know anything about data sharing we request from new researcher to do what we can do <laughs> so we have to improve all together and it is a, a small start but it is a start Excellent. Yeah, I'm, I have Dominique and Leslie on, but I would like to come back to that uh, topic of education and, you know, introducing uh, training and awareness of data management very early in the educational process. Uh, so let's come back to that. Keep that. But Dominique now. Yeah, actually, this fits into, into this also into training. Oh, excellent. <laughs> um, so maybe just a very brief introduction. So I'm from Frankfurt and we are also working in, in Germany. We just started the national research data infrastructure. Uh, not we, so this was done by the government apparently. And there was a lot of money given for the next 10 years to do this in various consortia. And, and I'm, I'm also representing a little bit one of these consortia, the national research data infrastructure for the earth sciences. So coming back to this, I think one of the, the issues with giving credit or how do we get people to input data into repositories or databases? Why don't we want to do it? And why is it complicated? I think one thing behind this is that we should maybe recognize it, and this should be part of this cultural change as a, as an, a separate method. So that it is not part of something, but it is something of its own and therefore deserves to be treated as something of its own. And this is why it requires this lot of, of work. And I think this is, if we, for example, see like 20 years ago, something like this isotopes came up and, and isotopes to a measure became big um, 
a bit older, um, but it, it became big then and it was recognized this is a set, this is a new method. This is something we should we should um, uh, we should focus on and, and this gives us new information. I think this is something similar with data because there's the knowledge, pure knowledge that data provide, but there's also understanding that data provide or the entirety of the data. So something really new that comes out of looking at all the data getting some new understanding. And this is sort of like a new field. And if we recognize it as a method, um, then it needs all what, what methods have. So it needs the training, the education for this method. Um, how do we treat data? How do we assign metadata? How do we store it? Where do we store it? And how do we retrieve the data? So what tools, what programming languages, what um, interactions, what and so on, we need to work with these data. And this is something, so this is this is not just something we attach to what we are doing. This is something, this is standing on its own feet. And I think this is what we need to recognize. And, and, and to me, this is the, this cultural change, which is actually also the buzzword within this NFDI that we need this. And um, I think this is, this is quite important. And this is quite comprehensive. It is not just a single, we need credit, we need, get people to this meet. And um, we should recognize it as something like, let's call it data science or whatever, which is currently quite a, a new word that's coming up or so. But I think this is really um, what we need. Thanks. Thanks, Dominic. Leslie, you're following on on this? Yeah, uh, I was just okay. gonna say, I was just gonna say the other um, throttle point is actually research grants. And that I know of some systems where you only get twenty, you only get eighty percent of the money you're allocated, and get the remaining twenty percent when the data that was part of that project is actually in a public repository, and um, what do you call it, accessible. I think uh, Bigo Demo does that. Um, so, and that as part of grants, particularly early career grants, is starting to train people that there is an overhead to managing and looking after data and that yes you budget for it but at the same time the grant funders have got to start putting in these requirements and recognizing that it is a valid cost and i know in australia for something like 20 years um, you could not get any funding in a research grant for compiling data and then they wondered why they didn't have any data accessible from the grants that they'd funded. So anyway, I'm just sort of saying we're talking about publications, but let's not forget there's a bit of a stick there in the grants, but let's have lots of carrots because if you have too many sticks, everyone goes and disappears and does something else. Well, that actually, you know, it's, it's interesting that you say with the grants, you know, grants often um, also have, have data that never sees a publication because things were not what expected and so on. And, but these data are as valuable for you know, others as, as the published data in many ways. And it brings me to the question that Denise Hills had uh, put into the Q&A here, you know, how should we handle credit for data that is gener generated, but not explicitly tied to a formal uh, publication. So I think that, you know, the answer here from, from Dominique is, is important that the way data sets are now published in repositories with the DOI, they have a real citation and can be cited independently of, of a publication. Uh, the problem quite often still being that publishers don't accept those data citations in the reference list. So again, we're coming back to, you know, um, need, back to the need of having a dialogue with the publishers and, and bringing this, this up again. Does anybody else want to say something to that particular aspect of? Yes, yes. Yes, no. and I, oh, Olivier, I, I didn't see who was first, sorry. Okay. I can add a word to Anthony. I understand his question because I used some geochemical database from others and used to improve the database 
by uh, compiling some other constants from literature. And I used to, to cite the original database and then cite the other paper that I compile in the original database. But it is a huge work and my work is not published in a way because my database is not, my new database is not available. Uh, I used to share with some colleagues who ask and I give them my database, but I am, I do not have credit for that. I do not need to have credit for that, but uh, may, maybe you, we can work on some um, interoperable database that are shared. Uh, I don't know how, but maybe uh, we can do something like that. Thanks, Kirsten. I think um, the, pub, the, the problem for getting credit for data is not, cannot be restricted to the publishers or the researchers, but it's, I think it's the full system and we have addressed many facets of that. The publisher, no, the funding agencies could be really, could make sure that data are published. And I was even talking to the German Research Foundation once and said, oh, I, I'm really happy that you have an open data policy now. But how do you how do you make sure that this happens when what people are, are promising in their their proposals? Because it would be so easy to check for the next proposal whether the, the data promised to be up, uploaded to a repository is available. But they said they don't have the manpower to do this. But this I think this could be one one way. And the other are definitely the publishers. But I think since Coptis, this has changed a lot, and most most art journals accept data citations, but still. It is when, and I have many of these conversations with researchers. I, I help publishing data at GFC Data Services. They say, no, I don't want the data to be cited because I don't get any point on my H index for citing data. I need the paper to be cited. But I said, well, then why don't you cite both? You cite the data when you use the data. But but this is always, um, this is still so, so deeply re in, in the heads of this full research system that the only credit you get is via high rank publications, that this is also like we have to really think think ample and bring bring the researchers and the publishers and the, the funders on the same on the same plate, I think. Yeah, and I wonder, I mean, that um, brings up in some way the question, you know, how do you um, how do you get the, the journals to, to change? And, you know, many of the journals are actually associated with professional societies. So we do have, you know, AGU, we have the Geochemical Society. Um, what, what can the role of the societies be actually? Is there a process that we can potentially initiate for the societies to take a, um, a more active role in the world of data and, um, you know, providing recommendations or, you know, endorsing recommendations. I remember that it was my very beginning in interacting with the, the Geochemical Society uh, way back in 2005 or six, I forget, it was, <laughs> was a Goldschmidt conference in Melbourne, um, where we actually uh, had a president of the society who was very supportive of, of data efforts. And the Geochemical Society created a statement or a, a policy statement on, on data. Uh, that has never been updated. It's there since 2006 or seven, and uh, it it would need a a real focus. So, um, how do we get the societies to be more active? I know AGU is is very focused on on data activities these days, but they are at a higher earth science wide level or even science wide level and not specifically focusing on, on geochemistry. Anyone? Yeah, Dominique. Um, 
I'm not sure the societies can necessarily um, endorse something, but I think societies as part of one geochemistries would be fantastic, just as supporters to show that they are there, that they are supporting this, that, and this is, they can direct people to. So they can say, this is, we support one geochemistry, um, please um, endorse what, what they are come up with in whatever way, hopefully a more bottom-up process, of course, so that everybody is part of this. And um, I think this is this is how they can contribute significantly. And I think this is how we could reach them most easily. And uh, so I would be hopeful and, and I'm optimistic that they would support something like one geochemistry. And I think this is this 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 would be a good way. And then just point to please, this is a good way to go. Yeah, I think, you know, we we have actually had, and you were part of that, I think, in One Geochemistry, a discussion on writing a short paper for elements or for one of, you know, the, the <laughs> um, communication channels to those communities and to the societies to um, create awareness and, and attract attention. I think it's, it's really relevant that uh, we are in a different world than 10, 15 years ago, and data needs to be on a society's agenda, is, is my opinion. Um, I actually see that we are, we went long, I had expected that we would um, finish early, but it was a great discussion, and I'm, I'm really um, happy to see, you know, the ongoing discussions in the Q&A and in the chat and so on. And we've had really uh, fantastic participation by the panelists here today. So we have 10 minutes left and I thought I would use that time to basically get just a one, two sentence takeaway from the panelists and uh, also asking members of the audience to put into the chat their takeaway from this session and you know and and maybe an action item you know that what what next what would you like to do you know let let's join in let's um, create more discussion uh, on an ongoing basis through one geochemistry but also you know we have these conferences where we can get together now in person again uh, with some virtual participation and and keep the dialogue going and have that communication to the relevant implementers to the funders to the publishers to the societies uh, really push from the community because that's very often what they want to hear so i'm i'm going through um, the list of the panelists and asking your feedback the opposite way around. So Olivier, can I ask you for your takeaway message? So thank you. My takeaway message is we still need to improve and I will continue to advocate for more open science, including open and fair data. And my last word, just do science right thank you very good point thank you olivier leslie i'd agree with olivier in that once i was asked by a ceo of my former organization how can we fix data in the organization i said fix the science get the science back to being data and conclusions but also being a senior citizen or alias an old fart I'm actually feeling we're getting the movement. I think people, when you hear people like Katie being so passionate and all you younger people, you're caring about it and you know about it. And I think we're going to get there now. Whereas for the last 20 or 30 years, there just have not been voices advocating for this. They're now here and more importantly, they're in the younger generation. So keep going because I haven't got much longer to go, I can assure you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, we're very grateful that you managed to stay up that long. It's, it's a real challenge uh, to, to be online until, what is it, getting towards midnight for you, right? Yes, don't oh, worry about goodness. it. I'm getting yes. used to it. <laughs> so next one, Steve. 
you have some thoughts at the end of the session. Yeah, I uh, I get I guess a couple of takeaways is that really we need to ensure ensure that the data producers get appropriate credit. Okay, and one of the new ideas that came out of this that I hadn't thought about before that came out of this um, this this meeting is the possibility of I think it's a big issue that there are places where you could just dump data. I'm glad. Uh, thank you for bringing that up, Denise Hills. Um, I think that there that this is something that we have to deal with, and one of one possible way to make sure that people um, contribute their data to the right places is to make some kind of figure out how to accredit. Um, appropriate data repositories, whereby if the data go into those repositories, they will be cited by the major cited, uh, citation indices. Okay, and then people can get credit if their data are cited. Um, and so I think that is a way to ensure that data producers do get credit or one of the one of the steps forward the other the other really important thing i think is that we need to make submission of the data part of the publication process and if we do that just like all of the other things that we do going from start to finish which is a long arduous process, this will be part of getting published and therefore people will be okay with doing it. Those are my final thoughts. Excellent. And Katie, you have the last word. Oh, no pressure then. I guess um, I've just found this debate really informative and I think it really highlighted how there's it's kind of a multifaceted challenge and no single solution is going to fix everything. But the discussions that we've had about, you know, and I really liked what Leslie said, you know, it can't be all sticks. We've got to have carrots there too. That kind of multifaceted approach, again, is something that we need. And I think the more we have these discussions, the more we shout about these kind of issues and the challenges outside of data management sessions, the more they're integrated into kind of normal science, even though they obviously are, you know, this is data, it's, it's like, you know, you can't have science without the data. So I think that's a really positive step forward. And I think you said, Kirstine, that, that there's um, sessions at Goldschmidt that aren't, you know, that, that we're reaching out to everyone who collects geoanalytical data, not just people who are interested in its curation. And I think that's something that we need to change. The more people talk about it, the, the better informed people are going to be and the easier we are going to be able to integrate it into our standard work plan. Just like Steve said, you know, we need to, it just should become routine. And it's about changing that attitude so that it's extra work. It's part of the work. And I think that is, um, that's really important moving forward. But I just wanted to thank everyone for their really interesting points that they've raised and the potential solutions that everyone has discussed. Thank you, Katie. That was a great end to this debate. I think I wanted to thank the panelists, uh, obviously the conveners, because getting this great debate uh, into the program at EGU was a major step. Uh, and uh, I think the discussion here has shown what a um, large range of um, topics, challenges, concerns are there. And I think we, we potentially started a movement here in <laughs> <laughs> with with this debate, I, I definitely hope so. And in that uh, context, wanted to remind everybody, uh, we had put the Slack channel of One Geochemistry in the chat. Uh, it's a way to keep the discussion going, post questions, uh, reach out for to those who may have some answers in research data management and so on. Uh, again, there's, there's sessions at the uh, Goldschmidt conference. There are workshops uh, that you can still sign up to uh, if you want, can participate virtually. I know with the 
meeting being in, on Hawaiian time, it's it's a challenge for uh, some people. Um, but we're we're going to continue, be it you know the next AGU meeting or GSA and EGU in twenty three and so on to keep the discussion going. Again, thank you all to the panelists for this fantastic um, debate. And thank you all uh, in the audience for contributing to the discussions, for listening in. And I hope to see you all again. Thank you so much and take care. <laughs>